All right, uh, Leviticus uh, chapter 23, and let's look at verse 33. Listen to what the Bible says. This is one of the Torah readings for today. There, the Lord's talking to Moses, and he tells him to tell the children of Israel that on the 15th day of the seventh month, which is today, today is the 15th day of the seventh month on the biblical calendar, it says it's the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles, also known as Sukkot, and it lasts how many days? Seven days. Seven days. Now, let's look at Deuteronomy. This is chapter 16, 13 through 15. It says you're to observe the Feast of Tabernacles for how many days? Seven days after you've gathered in all your grain and your wine. Now look at this. And you shall rejoice in your feast. Not only you, but also your son, your daughter, your manservant, maidservant, the Levite, the stranger, even the fatherless and the widow that are within your gates. Look at this. At seven days, you're to keep a solemn feast. So even though it's a solemn feast, you're supposed to rejoice every day. In the place which the Lord shall choose, which is where? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. It's not Argentina, okay? Why? It says, because the Lord your God is going to bless you in all of your increase and in all the works of your hands. Therefore, you shall what? Surely rejoice. Can you imagine God issues a commandment to be happy for seven days? No whiny whinies. Can, that's difficult for a lot of people not to whine for seven days. But here God commands us to rejoice for seven days. What if we say, I'm not under the law. I don't have to rejoice. I can be miserable all week if I want. <laughs> well, if that's the way you want, okay. Uh, look at Leviticus chapter 23, verse 40. Let's go back. Look at this. Here's a picture of Jerusalem during the Feast of Tabernacles up on the Temple Mount. And they all have their lulav that you see right here with the etrog. Uh, and look at this in Leviticus 23, 40. It says, on the very first day, which is today, they're to take the fruit of goodly trees. That's the etrog. All right. Branches of palm trees. There's the palm branch right there. And then it says, bows of thick trees. That's the myrtle. And then also willows of the brook, which is also represented here. And it says, again, look at this. You have to rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. Wow. All over the place. There's this harsh command to be happy. I know that's hard for some people. Now, look at this in Leviticus uh, 23. It goes on to say in verse 41 through 44, you shall keep it a feast to who? The to the Lord. That's who we're rejoicing before because he's been blessing us. And it says uh, it's to be a statute forever throughout all your generations. You're to keep it in the seventh month. Okay, you can't keep it in the eighth month like uh, Jeroboam tried to do. Uh, God said, no, it has to be in the seventh month. Okay, number seven is very important. And it, look at this. Three times God says you have to dwell in uh, Sukkot, sukkahs, uh, tabernacles, booths, little portable huts like you saw in the pictures for seven days. All who are native born in Israel shall dwell in booths. There's the second time. So that your generations may know. God says that I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths when I brought them out of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. And so Moses declared to Israel all the appointed feasts of the Lord. The whole concept of dwelling in booths is to realize they're temporary dwelling places. Okay? We have to realize we live in a sukkah. Our body is a temporary dwelling place. We have a new body coming. How many of you can hardly wait? That's when I'll really rejoice. <laughs> okay? I need a new body. But I want you to notice that three times he says, I want you to dwell in booths. Well, get a load of this. Here's a beautiful picture of the Mount of Olives for those of you that have been to Israel. You've seen this before. Look at Zechariah 14. Now, you have to realize that these events in Zechariah 14 have not happened yet. Zechariah 14 talks about the Mount of Olives splitting in two. That has not happened yet. Okay, it says, then the Lord will go out and fight against all the nations as when he fought in the day of battle. Look at this. His feet will stand in that day on the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. The Mount of Olives is going to be split in two from east to west, making a very great valley. Half the mountain is going to go north and half of it's going to go south. Can you imagine? Now, what you have, when you think of Israel, think of it going from north to south. 
most of the fault lines, like the Great Rift and everything, is all north to south. But here is an earthquake that happens east to west. And then the north is going to go further north and the south is going to go further south and there's going to be this great valley. And this is when all the waters are going to go downhill and fill the Dead Sea and make it come to life again. Wow. Now, look at this. Zechariah 14, 8 and 9. It goes on and says it'll happen in that day that living waters will go out from Jerusalem. Half of them are going to go toward the Dead Sea and half of them toward the Mediterranean. And in summer and winter it will be, and look at this, the Lord is going to be king over all the earth. And that day the Lord will be one and his name one. So we see when the Lord returns, part of the second coming, okay, happens during Sukkot. The Feast of Trumpets. See, the spring feasts were all fulfilled to the day of his first coming. The fall feasts will all be fulfilled to the day of his second coming. And here we're seeing events that will happen during Sukkot. It goes on to say in Zechariah 14, 14 through 19, uh, Judah is going to fight at Jerusalem and the wealth of all the nations around are going to be gathered together. The gold, the silver, apparel in great abundance. So shall the plagues of the horse, mule, camel, donkey, all the beasts that will be in these tents as is the plague. And look at this. Here it says, it shall come to pass everyone who is left of all the nations that came against Jerusalem. They have to go up every year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to Keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And who it will be, whoever doesn't come up of all the families of the earth to Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, even upon them will be no rain. And if Egypt doesn't come up, they'll have no rain, and they also get the plague, wherewith the Lord is going to smite all the heathen that do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And this shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. I think it's interesting in the Torah, three times he says you're to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And here in Zechariah, three times he says that if you don't, you're going to get no rain in the plague. Now, how many believe the Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Okay, would he command us to keep the Feast of Tabernacles Okay, and then say, okay, now you're cursed if you keep the Feast of Tabernacles because it's all done away with. Oh, and now in the future, you're going to be cursed if you don't keep the Feast of Tabernacles. That doesn't make sense. It's good. It's bad. It's good. Okay, so we have to understand all the feasts are dress rehearsals. So even though there is no temple, we still do the rehearsal of what the coming Feast of Tabernacles is going to be like when the Lord tabernacles among men for the thousand-year millennial reign. Now get a load of this. In 2 Peter 1, verse 16, he says, Look, we've not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and the coming. He's talking about the second coming of our Lord Yeshua HaMashiach. He says, We were eyewitnesses of His majesty. The, the, the apostles, disciples, were eyewitnesses of the second coming. They had, they had a future vision. Okay, let's look. At what they saw. When was he talking about? Let's go back to Matthew. Look at chapter 17, verse 4. Then answered Peter and said to Yeshua, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you will, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. This was at the transfiguration. And why do you think he said, let's build three sukkahs? Because it happened on Sukkot. That's why. Okay, he saw the second coming was during the Feast of Tabernacles, which is why all the nations have to come to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, let's look at Exodus chapter 25, verse 8 and 9. God says, let them make me a sanctuary, a holy dwelling place, that I may what? Dwell among them. Now, you don't see this in English. You only see it in Hebrew. He actually says that I may dwell within them. We are the sukkah. He wants to dwell within us, not just among us, but within us. But he said it had to be according to the pattern that you saw from heaven. So Moses had to make it after the pattern. Now look at Revelation chapter 21, verse 1 through 4. Here, after the millennial reign, we're talking about the 8,000th year. A day with the Lord is a 1,000 years. It's been 6,000 years almost completed with Adam. We're about to enter the 7,000th year, which is the millennial reign or the day of the Lord when he rules and reigns on earth. But then guess what? Just like you have Sunday through Saturday, then the eighth day 
is also the first day of the next cycle. And what do we see? The eighth day is the new heavens and the new earth. That's when we start over. So in Revelation 21, 1 through 4, he sees the new heaven and the new earth. The first heaven, the first earth have passed away. There was no more sea. And I, John, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the sukkah, the tabernacle of God is now with mankind, and he's going to dwell with them. And they'll be his people, and God himself will be with them, will be their God, and God's going to wipe away all tears from their eyes. There'll be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, nor shall there be any more pain, because the former things are all passed away. Okay, well, if you notice, at the end of the seven-day feast of Sukkot, there's the eighth day known as Shemini Atzeret, okay, which is, means the eighth day of assembly where everyone comes together. And that is for representative of the new heavens and the new earth. Everything is so easy to understand when you focus on the patterns. Now look at Numbers chapter 29. This also is part of the Torah portion today. It says on the 15th day of the seventh month, that's today, the anniversary, you're to have a holy assembly, which is what we're doing. You're not to do any ordinary work. You're to keep a feast to the Lord for seven days. And look at the burnt offering they were to do. 13 bulls. They were to offer 13 bulls on the first day. And then the next day, 12, the next day, 11, the next day, 10, the next day, nine. Okay. And it goes down for the seven days. Well, guess how many total bulls were slain for the Feast of Tabernacles? 70. That's exactly right. Why were there 70 bulls slain? Because there were 70 nations the world was divided into in Genesis 10. And so here's what's happening. On Yom Kippur, that is specifically related to Israel's Day of Atonement as a nation of priests. They were to make atonement for themselves because five days later, they are going to make atonement for the nations. It says God so loved who? The world, not just Israel. He loved the whole world. So he had a pattern. And you got to remember, Yom Kippur is celebrated in heaven. Everything on earth was done in heaven. Tabernacles is being celebrated in heaven. God's dwelling with them right now. Okay, so we have to understand God wanted to make atonement for the nations. So every Sukkot, they were making atonement for the nations. But the devil's so smart. What does he do? He gets the stupid nations to go and destroy the very thing God was using to make atonement for them. It's like they were cutting off their nose to spite their face. Uh, the sages say if they'd only known what God was doing, they would have stationed their armies around Jerusalem to protect it while they were being atoned for. But such is mankind and their foolishness. Okay, so actually each bull was representative of one of the nations. So now we're going to take a look uh, at the temple. Uh, actually, this is uh, from the Temple Institute, but you can also get this if you go to Jerusalem. They have a model of the whole city there. Uh, but let's take a look at what was going on in the temple today, on this very day, uh, how they celebrated a thousand, couple thousand years ago. First off, get a load of this. It is recorded historically there were over two million people in Jerusalem. Can you imagine? Two million. And they came from all the nations because they had to be there. Okay, so the Jews, I'm not talking about the heathen. There were heathen that dwelt in Jerusalem. But Jews from all the nations would come every year to Jerusalem. I mean, how many of you have ever been to the Puyallup Fair here or State Fair? It's crazy. Well, can you imagine two million people there in Jerusalem? Uh, and so everyone came with the idea of we're going to party. It is party time. We're going to rejoice. We're going to be happy. Plus, can you imagine? Uh, I, I know how people love getting together. Can you imagine seeing friends from another country and everyone comes together at one time and you're seeing all your friends you haven't seen in a year? Uh, and so it was truly a big party. Well, one of the focuses of all the rejoicing had to do with what was called the water libation, where they would pour out a pitcher of water. We'll talk about more in a little bit because they're praying for rain. If they don't have the winter rain, they're not going to have a good harvest. So every year at this time, they're praying for rain, okay? Uh, and they said it was so, uh, it was the greatest rejoicing time ever. Now, uh, get a load of this. Let me see if I, I don't have my little, 
I should have my laser here. But if you'll notice in the women's court, which is the, the smaller brown area, in there were these four big lamps. Do you see those big lamps? Okay. Uh, they had these balconies where the women could watch the men dancing below and partying and having fun. But those lamps were seven and a half stories high. And guess what? There were little uh, temple priests that had seven and a half story ladders that were, they would climb that. Uh, and, and that's how they would light the fires, okay? And they would use uh, priestly garments that have been so worn out they couldn't be washed. It's just stained with uh, blood and animal sacrifices and they couldn't clean them anymore. Those linen garments were cut into strips, okay? And then they were used for wicks. So it was the priestly garments that were soaked in oil that was also used, okay, as uh, wicks. Uh, those were like seven gallon buckets. I don't know how much that weighed on their back. I hope someone was holding the ladder below. Okay. Uh, in uh, John uh, chapter 8, let me show you this. Uh, oh, I'll show you in a minute. In John chapter 8, this is what's amazing. You know in John chapter 7, it was the Feast of Tabernacles. That's when the whole thing is, and we'll talk about that more in a little bit. But then in John 8, verse 12, look. Therefore Yeshua spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not dark, uh, walk in darkness, but have the light of life. They say Jerusalem, you know, could be seen from all over Israel. I mean, it's up on a hill, and you could see the lights. They didn't have electricity back then, okay? And these seven-and-a-half-story lights, four of them, you know, these had four lamps just brightly shining. Oh, my goodness, people would see Jerusalem from all over. Uh, now, What's interesting, as the people were singing, they would be singing, a lot of the Levites would juggle torches. Can you imagine? They're juggling to flaming torches, and they're uh, having a party time. Uh, and then uh, there's uh, right here before the Nicanor Gate, there are these 15 steps. Well, uh, they're singing uh, the Psalms, okay? Uh, that's what would happen. They'd stand on uh, the steps uh, from the women's court. That's the women's court. You can see the balconies above. That would lead into the court where they would do all the sacrifices. That would, uh, where that would uh, lead into her. And on Sukkot, these two priests, they would have these trumpets, and they'd be blowing uh, these silver trumpets at the top of the stairs. Uh, and all of this was in honor of what was going to be going on, the water libation that is behind those doors. Uh, what is going on. And then, of course, they, they made these special elevated balconies so uh, more and more people could watch uh, what was going on. Now, here's what's exciting. The daily ceremony, all seven days, imagine this, two million people. Can you imagine each one of them bringing a sacrifice? Two million sacrifices? Okay. Can you imagine? Okay, there's 24 courses of priests. And so what they, they all had to serve. Typically, uh, uh, each priestly uh, group, uh, one, each course would serve one week. But during the feast, when you got two million people there, it's all hands on deck. And so all 24 courses serve. Well, they divide them into three groups of eight courses. One group, all they did was the sacrifices all day long. They're just constantly doing all the sacrifices. And then there was another group that was headed by the high priest, and they're going south, out the water gate, and they would go all the way down to the city of David, to the pool of Siloam, early in the morning, and they would be uh, grabbing water from the pool of Siloam in a silver pitcher, uh, a golden pitcher, and the reason why is the pool of Siloam had living water. Now, we all know Yeshua is the living water. His associate had a silver pitcher filled with wine. Okay, so you have uh, this great parade of uh, hundreds of thousands of people all singing early in the morning as they're going down to the Pool of Siloam. Then they march back up, and guess what? That's what we're going to look at tomorrow in our virtual tour of Jerusalem. We're going to be looking at the actual path that they came down and went back up on Sukkot. During Sukkot, tomorrow. It's going to be incredible. And they've just discovered it. I've, I've seen parts of it on other tours, but now they've been able to uncover virtually the entire path. Okay. So anyway, uh, 
here's the cool thing. Once they got, they would go back through the water gate into the Israeli court, and then they would pour the water and the blood from the wine into special places in one corner of the altar, okay? And then, after they're pouring uh, the water and the wine, uh, the living water and the blood in the corner, they would do a Jericho march around the altar, okay? One time, every single day, they would march around the altar as part of their prayer for rain. But on the last day of Sukkot, the seventh day, they do this Jericho march where they're marching around it seven times, Okay, and then they would uh, do this water libation and everyone singing and praising and shouting God. Now, listen to this. This is what is totally incredible. The Psalms was their hymn book. Okay, so I'm going to give you the very words to the song they were singing every single day. Psalms 118 verse 14. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. What's the Hebrew word for salvation? Yeshua. So here on the Feast of Tabernacles, they're singing, the Lord is my strength and my song, because they have to rejoice, and he has become my Yeshua. Well, guess where does that verse come from? That verse comes from the song at the sea when they cross the Red Sea. Look at Exodus 15, 2. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God. I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. Because that's what they had to do on this day. Okay? Well, guess what? That phrase is the only phrase that is found in all three sections of the Tanakh. Okay, the Tanakh, the first part is the Torah. We just found it in the Torah. Okay, well, guess what? Uh, it's also in the Nevi'im, which is the prophets. Okay, and the Ketavim, which is the writings. Psalms is in the writings. Where is it found in the prophets? It's in Isaiah. And guess what? They literally would sing Isaiah 12 on this day because it's a short six verses, and it's the song they're singing. So look at what they're singing. Uh, oh, before I go there, Let's go back to John 7 during the Feast of Sukkot and look at this. Now, the Jewish festival, which really is the biblical festival, the Feast of Sukkot was at hand, but now it's in the middle of the feast. Yeshua goes up into the temple and he's teaching, and the Judeans were marveling, saying, How does this man know anything? He's not educated. You know, who is this guy? Well, little did they know. Okay. So they're also singing Isaiah 12. Let's look at verse 2 through 5. Oh, this is just so incredible. Okay. Behold, God is my Yeshua, salvation. I will trust, I will not be afraid for the Lord. The Lord, here it is, is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. Now, here it is. Therefore, with joy, will you draw water out of the wells of Yeshua or out of the wells of salvation? And here they have the living water and they're pouring it out and they're saying with joy, you, so you draw water from the wells of Yeshua. Well, guess what? Then it says in that day, you will say, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, declare his doings among the people. Proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for he has done excellent things. Let this be known in all the earth. Well, guess what? Here they're singing this. And here, who was this guy interrupting our worship service? Who does he think he is? It was at this time that Yeshua stood up and cried out. Look at John 7, 37 and 38. On the last great day of the feast, Yeshua stood, and what does he do? He cries out, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, from within him will flow rivers of living water. So just as they're singing with joy, you draw water from the wells of salvation, Yeshua stands up and says, yes, they're talking about me. Can you imagine how everyone was shocked when he interrupts it and says, this is talking about me. What, you won't believe this? Hold on to your shorts. Look at the last words. They have to finish the song. And look at the words of the song in Isaiah 12, 6. Cry aloud and shout, you inhabitant of Zion, because the Holy One of Israel is standing in your midst. Wow. Shock and awe. That is crazy. Now, so that's part of what's going on. There's a third group. 
and they are going down to what is called the Mozart Valley. They're going out the eastern gate, and they're grabbing willow branches. These willow branches, they say, were 20 feet long. Now, thousands of priests are doing this parade, and they each have willow branch 30 feet long, and there's rows and rows of priests, and they're taking a step, and they're waving the willow branch. And they're taking a step, and they're waving the willow branch as these thousands of people rejoicing on either side are praising God as they're going up. And guess what? They're doing it simultaneously as the thousands are coming up the southern steps with the high priest, with the living water and the blood coming up to the southern gate. Here, thousands of people in its parade are coming up to the eastern gate. Now, you can hear hundreds of thousands of these shaking. You can just hear the willows. Well, guess what? The Hebrew word for wind is ruach, which is also translated as the spirit, referring to the spirit of God. So you've got the spirit of God. You can feel it and hear it moving up to the eastern gate. At the same time, the living water and the wine is coming up the southern gate. And then when they would get to their uh, respective places, they would put these giant willow trees kind of forming a sukkah over the altar. But guess what? You're not going to believe this. Okay. Right at the corner, okay, so to the south is the bottom left corner. East, you can see the, the bridge that went over to Mount of Olives. They're all coming up simultaneously. According to uh, Jewish writings, in the corner there was another priest who was playing a flute. They could not enter either one into the temple until the priest played the flute. Because a flute is pierced, he was known as the pierced one who would call for the wind and the water to enter into the temple. This is incredible. Okay, with that said, we're just going to have to take a break. I haven't even been watching my clock, so I hope I didn't go over. I think I'm close. All right, so with that, we'll stand, uh, and we'll close, and then we'll come back. We'll have a little bit of time of worship, and then we're going to have a lot more fun. Wahoo. All right, let's uh, pray. Let me go, uh, let me see where I'm at, right here. Let me go there. All right. Avinu Mokenu, our Father, our King, we just thank you so much for everything you're, you're doing in our lives. Wow, we can sure see why we need to rejoice today. This is the day, Father, that we want to praise you and exalt you because there's going to be a new heaven, a new earth. We're going to have new bodies, and we just want to rejoice in you. Father, I thank you so much for all of those that are here, here with us in our, our studio, for all those that are all over the United States live streaming, for all those all over the world. Father, in over a dozen nations, over 300 cities right now live streaming, we just thank you for every single one of them. And Father, as we all become one, a cod, I thank you that each and every one of us want to magnify the Torah, make it honorable. And Lord, uh, I just thank you for all those who help uh, and donating uh, to El Shaddai that we can make this possible all over the world. In Yeshua's name, amen. Together, blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua, you alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. We'll take a break. All right. Am I ever excited? We are now going to look at the birth of Yeshua, King Messiah. Believe it or not, it happened on this very day. It did not happen at Christmas. And guess what? He was not born in the spring at Passover either, for those of you that have uh, fallen into that trap. Uh, I'm going to prove to you, beyond a shadow of a doubt, biblically, why and how Yeshua was born today. Uh, and I've got scripture after scripture after scripture uh, to prove that, not some uh, warm, fuzzy feeling uh, about sheep being born in the spring, therefore he had to be born in the spring. Uh, one of the most important things, uh, let me see if I even have it in my notes, because I may just add this to my notes. Let me just see, because I definitely want to bring it up. 
Uh, yeah, I don't have it in my notes, but many of you are very familiar. Let me just take care of the spring question uh, just right away. Uh, first off, you know, it says in the Gospels, he was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. Okay, I think everyone's aware of that. I can look up the verse and give it to you. But he was about 30 years of age. That means it was almost his birthday. And when did he start his ministry? He started his ministry in the fall, right at the month of Elul, going into Yom Kippur and Sukkot. And uh, first off, the reason why you know that, uh, now some people disagree on whether his ministry was three and a half years or one and a half years. But either way, everyone knows he died at Passover. Okay, I think everyone agrees he dies at Passover. If he was, if it says it was about to begin his birthday, if he was born at Passover, he couldn't have served either one and a half or two and a half or three and a half. It had to be one or two or three because evidently then he'd be born at Passover and dying at Passover. So it couldn't have happened at Passover. Okay, pretty simple. Uh, but let's go and let's look at how he was born on Sukkot. Okay. Well, let's begin with the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, and verse 5. It says, There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, not just any priest, a certain priest, who was named Zechariah of the priestly divisions of Abijah. He had a wife of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elisheva, in common English, Elizabeth. Okay, now, it says it was after the priestly division of Abijah. So let's look a minute in Luke 1, 8 and 9. Now it happened while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. Okay, they had a lottery system as far as uh, there were only so many priests, okay? There were a lot of priests, but only so many priests, and they would only serve 20 years. But even though you served 20 years, if you only serve one week a year, because there were so many priests, there were 24 courses, if you can only serve one week a year over 20 years, you know, that's like 20 times you got a chance. But if there are thousands of priests doing it, it's just like being a, in a football game or a basketball game. Do you want to sit on the bench or do you want to be in the game? Everyone wants to be in the game, okay? So they would have lottery draws. Who's the one who got to burn the incense? Who's the one who got to do the sacrifices? Who's the one who got to take the ashes off? Who's the one that got to light the menorah? Who's the one that got to put out, you know, or change the menorah? They say oftentimes you could be a priest your entire life and never be able to be the one to burn the incense, okay? So here, it so happens, it's, it's like a, he's old. It's like at the end of his 20th year of serving when he wins the lottery, okay? It's like, wahoo, I finally get, and what a time to have this happen. Okay, now look at this. Uh, it's First Chronicles 24 is where this is found. It says, okay, here are the divisions of Aaron, the sons of Aaron. There was Nadab and Abihu. Eliezer and Nitabar. We know Nadab and Abihu became crispy critters, okay? They were burnt and uh, they died before the Lord. They had no kids. Therefore, Eliezer and Itamar executed the priest's office. We go to 1 Chronicles 24.10. The seventh went to Hakos and the eighth went to Abijah. Yay! So now we know by connecting the Gospels to the priestly division that Abijah was the eighth course, in other words, they serve the eighth week. Now look at 1 Chronicles 24, 19. It says, these were the orderings of them in their service to come into the house of the Lord according to the manner under Aaron, their father, as the Lord God of Israel had commanded them. Okay, so here we go. Look at this little chart here. Because Nisan 1 begins the religious year, I have this really simple. April 1st to April 7th is the first course. And then the second week of April is the second course. But guess what? That comes to Passover. Passover week, there were so many priests, it was all hands on deck and every course would serve. So then the, that third week, the 15th through the 24th, First would be the third course with all 24 courses, but then the following week, the third course 
would have their own course by themselves because they all had to jump in Passover week. So then we go to the next month of May. The, then the fourth course would serve, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh. But what is happening that last week of May, first week of June, yes, it is the eighth course, which is the course of Abijah. But guess what? Then comes Pentecost or Shavuot. And again, everybody has to serve. So Zechariah not only had to serve his week, he had to serve an additional week before he could go home. Okay, because that's when Pentecost is. Now, look at this. Deuteronomy 16, 16. It says, three times in a year, all the males have to appear before the Lord your God at the place he will choose. And it mentions when this has to happen. It has to happen during Passover at the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It has to happen at the Feast of Weeks or Shabbat or Pentecost. And it happens, has to happen at when? The Feast of Booths or Tabernacles or Sukkot. That is when you will have one to two million people in Jerusalem at Passover, at Pentecost, and at Sukkot. You're going to have millions of people. Okay, so <clears throat> here we go. Think of this. If you've ever been in Jerusalem at one of the feasts, it's going to be packed at the Western Wall because they have to be there. Now, let's look at Luke 1, 10 and 11. It says the whole multitude, okay? The whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense, okay? That's either 9 in the morning or 3 in the afternoon, it's going to be, and I believe it was probably in the afternoon, but regardless, it says here, there appeared to Zechariah an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. So now let's go to Luke chapter 1, verse 23 and 24. Okay, it happened when the days of his service were fulfilled, he departed to his house. After these days, Elisheva, his wife conceived and she hid herself for how long? Five months. Okay, so when it, it, that word there for the whole multitude is plethora or plethos in the Greek, plethora, which means bunches and bunches. Okay, the fact that there are multitudes there, it tells you, is the Feast of Pentecost. This confirms the eighth course we saw is at Pentecost. It's the time of incense. Everyone is waiting for him to come out and say the priestly benediction but he can't talk. He can't speak. And so, but this is telling you in the scriptures that the eighth course is going to serve during Pentecost and it's Pentecost. This is why there's millions of people in Jerusalem at the time. Okay. Now, so back to the course. He not only has to serve that last week of May, first week of June, he also has to wait. I believe he has a vision on Pentecost. That's when the vision takes place. And, but now he's got to serve the whole week of Pentecost, and he can't go home till the following week after the vision, and he can hardly get, wait to get started to get this baby on the road, okay? <laughs> All right, so now, now it says here it was the fifth month, okay? It says Elisheva, his wife, conceived, okay, right after he gets home, and she hides herself for five months. Okay, so let's look at this. If it is the middle of June, those last two weeks of June when she conceives and she hides five months, we have July, August, September, October, all of November. We're now coming to the end of November, right? Okay, now watch this. Luke 1, 26. And now in the sixth month, well, guess what? That takes you to the last two weeks of December. She hit herself five months. That's through the end of November. Now in the sixth month, it says, and so we're looking at the last two weeks of December, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee named Nazareth. And so what happens in chapter 135 and 36 of Luke? She says, well, how can I have a baby, Miriam says, because I haven't known anybody. And the angel says, the Holy Spirit is going to come on you. The power of the Most High is going to overshadow you. Therefore, also, the Holy One who was born from you will be called the Son of God. 
And then he says, behold, Elisheba, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is what month? The sixth month with her who was called barren. And so what does she do? She goes over to see Elizabeth. And look at Luke 156. Miriam stays with her how many months? Three. Well, let's see. Six plus three is what? And how long does it take to have a baby? Okay. This isn't real difficult. Okay. And so what happens? You go three months. This is going to take you to the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And you find John the Baptist who comes like in the spirit of Elijah, who always arrives at Passover, which is why they have Elijah cup, tells you John the Baptist was born at Passover. That way, and so she stays there until Passover. Okay. Now. Look at this. Here comes Luke chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. And so it was while they were there, the dates were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought her firstborn son and wrapped him in what kind of clothes? Swaddling clothes. Swaddling clothes laid him in a manger because there was no room for them at the inn. Well, get a load of this. Okay. If she conceived during Hanukkah, okay, the end of December, that's Hanukkah. So here the light of the world is conceived during Hanukkah, the end of December. You go nine months for Miriam. That puts you at the end of September, which is the Feast of Tabernacles. When there's a million people, why was there no room in the inn? Hello, there's no room in the inn because there's a million people there. All right, that is why. Now, what's amazing he was wrapped in swaddling clothes. Do you remember that I told you that uh, when I described John 7, John 8, uh, those big, tall, seven and a half story lights that the young priests would climb and they would use priestly garments that had been used to do the sacrifices that had been stained with the sacrifices from their sins. They cut them into strips and they would literally put them in wicker baskets in the women's court and the women could go and use those linen strips. Those were the swaddling clothes. Yeshua was wrapped in priestly garments stained with our sins from the blood of the sacrifices. This is incredible. Those were the priestly garments. Okay. Now, if you remember from earlier this morning, I was telling you in Exodus 15 too, what are they singing? They're singing during the Feast of Tabernacles. Okay. <clears throat> the Lord is my strength and song he has become my Yeshua salvation. He is my God. I'm going to do what? I'm going to build a sukkah. I'm going to prepare my habitation. My father's God and I will exalt him. Now look at Psalm 118. They always sing the Hallel. Psalm 113 through Psalm 118. Can you imagine? There's a million people singing happy birthday to Yeshua and don't even realize it. It's his birthday. They totally miss it. Here he is just being born. He's in a little sukkah. Okay, now look at Psalm 118. What are they singing? The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Remember you were commanded to rejoice? The voice of rejoicing. And Yeshua is in a sukkah of the righteous. That's what they're singing. Yeshua is in the sukkah of the righteous. And they don't even know that there's a little baby named Yeshua who's dwelling in the sukkah of the righteous. Okay, look at verse 24 and 25. This is the day the Lord has made we will what? Rejoice. Why? They're commanded to rejoice. Why? Because God foreordained. How many of you believe that Yeshua, that the Father planned on Yeshua dying before creation? He had, it says in Revelation, he was slain from the foundation of the world. This was all pre-planned. Not only did the Father pre-plan his death 4,000 years in advance, he also planned his birth 4,000 years in advance. This is why he had his great forefather, David, not only write the funeral hymns that would be sung at his death, he wrote the happy birthday song that would be sung when he was born. And so here they're singing the happy birthday songs by David who wrote it a thousand years before Yeshua was even born. Here they're commanded to rejoice. The father says, I tell you what, whether the world likes it or not, they will rejoice <laughs> on my son's birthday. Okay, only God can write a script like this, guys. And it says, save now, I beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech you, send now prosperity. Okay, so here they are 
commanded to build these sukkahs, and there would have been sukkahs all over the whole nation of Israel that have been sukkahs. They would have been all over the Mount of Olives. They were in Bethlehem. Yeshua was born in Beit Lechem or Bethlehem. That's only like three miles from Jerusalem, okay? Uh, and there was no room in the inn, so they gave birth uh, to Yeshua in a sukkah. Uh, just a couple of miles from Jerusalem, so it's an easy walk for Joseph to go to do what he has to do at the temple, go back home, and everyone, it's not just them, everyone was partying in the sukkah. So here is Yeshua being born in a sukkah on Sukkot. Now, the, what's interesting, that last day is also known as Simchat Torah, or rejoicing in the Torah. How do you know Yeshua is the living Torah? So here they're celebrating Simchat Torah. They're all rejoicing in the Torah. And again, they don't even realize what's going on. Okay, now we're going to go to Luke chapter 2. Look at verse 8 through 11. There were shepherds in the same country staying in the field, keeping watch by night over their flock. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood by them, and the glory of the Lord shines around them. And they were terrified. And the angel said to them, don't be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of what? Rejoice. Reason to rejoice. You only are command to rejoice during Sukkot. Here we go. This is telling us also he was born during Sukkot. Which will be to all the people, for there is born to you this day. And this is the day the Lord has made in the city of David a Savior who is Messiah the Lord. Oh my goodness. Now guess what? It is after the Feast of Tabernacles. Now if you live in Israel, you know that's when the rainy season comes. They're praying for rain. I remember the water libation, the whole thing is rain. We need rain. Well, guess what? After Sukkot, all the sheep are taken away from the hills and put in their pens because nobody wants to be out in the freezing rain and in the cold. Uh, you know, so this is the time when the shepherds are out at night. The shepherds are not going to be out at night during Christmas in the middle of winter because you're not going to find any sheep in the middle of winter out at night. So again, this is showing you how it happened at Sukkot. Now, let's see. Take a look at this too. Okay, up there is Nazareth. That is where uh, the Lord grew up. Okay, and if you remember, Joseph and Miriam had to go down to Bethlehem or Beit Lechem uh, because of the tax. Okay, well, first off, if you're a governor and you want tax, you want it when they have money. Okay, well, guess what? After Sukkot, they got the money. They've got the harvest. They're bringing their first fruits. Okay, that's the time you tax people anyway. And believe me, the tax didn't take one day. Uh, it took a, probably a processing of a whole year to get all of this done. Okay. But Jerusalem, I want you to know, is about 40 miles to the south. Now, can you imagine? First off, you have to realize it snows in Jerusalem, okay? It gets cold in Jerusalem. Can you see how many of you women, if you're nine months pregnant and you're even running late, want to ride a camel 40 miles in the middle of winter? I don't think so. That is not being very nice. And so the Lord isn't going to have Miriam ride a camel or a donkey 40 miles in the middle of freezing rain and snow. No. At Sukkot, what happens? The whole town travels together for security from raids and robbers and everything else during the three pilgrimage feasts. Everyone in town comes together. They all travel together to Jerusalem for protection, which is exactly what happens during Sukkot, which again shows you why he was born at Sukkot, why there was no room at the end, because everybody is there. Okay, now, look at this. John 1, 1 through 14. It says, and the word was made flesh, and what did he do? He tabernacled among us when? During the Feast of Tabernacles. Hello, this is not difficult. Okay, and it says that we beheld his glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. Okay, this is telling us he was born at the Feast of Tabernacles. Look at Luke 2, 13. It says, suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God, saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Wow. Isn't this incredible? Even the angels. Can you imagine? Again, there's no electricity. 
the entire earth is pitch black. And then that first Sukkot night, all the only light in the entire world is the flames on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Okay, the light of the world has just been born. And all the angels, they're cracking up laughing. I can just see them cracking up laughing because here Yeshua is born. Everyone's singing happy birthday and they don't even get the connection. Everyone is praising God, which is what God wanted them to do. But they missed the fact that Yeshua was literally born and that's who they're worshiping. Okay, so with that said, look at this. Sukkot is seven days. And then after that, there is what is known as the eighth day. That is Shemini Atzeret, the eighth day of assembly. It also is to be a Sabbath as well. Okay, now get a load of this. Look at Luke 2.21. When eight days were fulfilled for the circumcision, you're circumcised on what day? The eighth day of the child. His name was called Yeshua, which was given by the angel before he was even conceived in the womb. So guess what? Here, they bring Yeshua, circumcising him on the eighth day in the temple, confirming the covenant to Abraham, the blood covenant of, of everything belonging to him. So this is incredible. Also, when you see he was born on the first day of Sukkot, you see he's circumcised on the eighth day, shedding his blood in the temple, confirming the covenant to Abraham. This is beyond amazing. Okay, let's look at Luke 2. This is verse 22 through 24. When the days of their purification according to the Torah of Moses were fulfilled, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord as it is written in the Torah of the Lord. Every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And they had to do what? They also had to offer sacrifices according to that which is said in the Torah of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Well, you know what's interesting? That is not really the whole story. That is true, but it's only partially true. Because if it's according to the Torah of the Lord, let's go and look at what the Torah actually says. In Leviticus chapter 12, look at this. And when the days of her purifying are fulfilled for a son or for a daughter, she has to bring what? A lamb. Well, she didn't have a lamb of the first year for a burnt offering. And then it says a young pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation to the priest. But there's the deal. Look at this. If she's not able to bring a lamb, she's too poor. She doesn't have any money. She can't afford to get a lamb. Then she shall bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons. Okay. So what is this telling us? The three magi with all the money hadn't arrived yet. They didn't come at his birth. They actually came a couple years later. All right. So at the time, they didn't have any money. They couldn't even afford a lamb. Okay, and now one was to be for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering and the priest shall make atonement for her and she shall be clean. Can you imagine? I know that Miriam and Joseph probably wish they could have afforded a lamb, but little did they know they had a lamb, the lamb of God. Amen. Isn't that awesome? So with that said, uh, we're going to wrap this part up. We hope to see everyone tomorrow at 10 o'clock for the virtual tour. And then at noon, uh, bring your lulavs. And we're going to be waving our lulavs. But let's stand and let's pray. And let's rejoice in this wonderful Sukkot holiday. Avinu Malkenu, our Father, our King. We just thank you so much that we can bring our first fruits to you on your birthday. Father, this whole week is a week of us bringing our offerings and tributes to you and honor you as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Father, and we bring our offerings with great joy. We're rejoicing that we even have anything to give because all comes from you anyway. It's not ours. You've given us everything. And we just want to give you part back as a way of saying, yep, you're our king. You are our king. And we want to give back to you the part that you deserve as we honor you and praise you for all you've done for us. And we thank you that you want to bless us, 
that not only do you want to bless us, especially this year with triple fold blessings of the sixth cycle, Father, but you want to put your name upon us. That is worth more than all the currency of the world put together. Uh, being called your child, your daughter, your son. We cannot think of any greater honor. And Father, we want to honor you by magnifying the Torah and making it honorable again. So we thank you that as you told Moses to tell Aaron to say this prayer, Ivarekaka Adonai Vaish Mareka, Ya'er Adonai Panavileka Vihuneka, Yisa Adonai Panavileka Vihasem. Laka shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In that most wonderful name, Ayeh Asher Ayeh. Amen. Go in peace. We'll see you online tomorrow, 10 o'clock Pacific time. Shalom.